All right, so anyway, uh, the, the first part was a welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for, for coming and hanging out with us. Um, and there's some of you who are new to us and some of you who have done this with us before. Um, so just I was just giving a little preamble on uh, Hourglass and how it came to be. Um, and essentially, uh, for those of you who, who haven't heard the spiel before, uh, my family moved here in the early 60s. Um, I had a great opportunity to grow up here, um, to be a part of this whole magnificent um, evolution that Napa Valley has been a part of. I can tell you that the early 60s and even well into the 70s, Napa was uh, quite different than it is today and, and much sleepier and sort of off the beaten track. And then, of course, you know, the world has discovered us um, since. And so my father bought what became the Hourglass Estate site in 1976. Um, he bought it as a home site uh, with no aspirations of being in the wine business, but he was a practical guy and he, he wanted landscaping that essentially would pay for itself. And he tried to plant fruit trees on this rocky knoll and they lasted all of about a month or two months and, and all died. And he happened to be at a cocktail party and he was bemoaning how um, a little of a green thumb he had to Dan Duckhorn, and Dan said, listen, you knucklehead, um, that hillside would be ideally suited for grapes, not um, fruit trees, which need a lot of deep, rich, loamy soil and so forth. Why don't you try planting uh, uh, grapes there? And so my dad, in all of his great wisdom, said, that's a great idea. I'm going to go out and do it. Um, and so he went out, and he ended up planting Zinfandel, which was his favorite grape at the time. And so we ended up contracting the fruit from that site from the late 70s all the way up until the early 90s. And the, the fruit from that went into kind of the core of the Camus uh, Zinfandel program for a number of years. And a few others uh, bought fruit from us as well. And then in 1990, my dad passed away. I took over the management of the vineyard for my mom. And um, my mom really didn't want to be a part of this whole thing. And she decided she wanted to sell the property. And, uh, at that point, I convinced her that that was a really bad idea and that we should hold on to the property and that there were some amazing changes going on in Napa in the early 90s that maybe we could participate in. And those changes you know, are pretty well documented at this point um, with the whole emergence of um, a lot of these really small little postage stamp vineyards that had been selling to larger wineries um, started to kind of take control of their own future and do um, estate wine driven uh, projects. and. A lot of the cult wines um, sort of blossomed out of that early formation of, um, of changes in the vineyard and changes in the cellar. And I thought that was a cool thing. And, and so I convinced my mom that that was the, the path that we might want to follow and, and um, jump this train. And, and so um, long story short, we, we did and we replanted to Cabernet in 1992 or 93. Um, ended up with our first vintage of Hourglass Estate in 1997. And that vineyard has proved itself to be um, a really magnificent site. And we can talk a little bit more about that when we taste the third one in the flight, which is the Hourglass Estate wine. Um, but the, the project took off on us. We were making five, 600 cases of wine a year from that property. And uh, we had much larger demand than we had supply. So we started to look around for another piece of property that we could book in with Hourglass um, from a qualitative standpoint, but stylistically would be uh, a different representation of Napa. Um, and that became a really, really challenging thing to execute. Um, the bar was set pretty high with Hourglass, and there's just you know, not a whole lot of vineyards um, like that in, in Napa Valley or the world for that matter. So by luck, after about three or four years of searching around, um, I stumbled upon what became the Blue Line Estate and we acquired that property in 2006 and went about the business of reorganizing that property. It was 20 planted acres when we bought it. It had Cabernet, Merlot, and Cab Franc on it. Um, we pulled out about half of the vineyard. We reset it with a um, uh, variety of different uh, clonal selections of those three varietals. And then we added Tiperdo and Malbec. So we had all five red border varietals there. And then we built the winery there so that we could... Um, meet the estate nomenclature. It was really important to us that um, we kind of um, execute this plan to be an estate wine or an estate wine group. And so having our own winery became the key, 
key piece of that puzzle. So to be in a state wine, you have to own your own winery, you have to own your own vineyards. They have to be in the same appellation, and the wine can never leave the winery itself. And so um, from that point on, once we were able to have our own facility, then we were able to implement the uh, estate nomenclature, which you'll find now on all of our labelings. So what you guys are going to taste um, today are three um, different wines, uh, predominantly Cabernet. Uh, the first wine is actually a blend of Cab, Merlot, and uh, Petit Cardot. Um, that is declassified wines. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second two wines will be um, the Blue Line Estate Cabernet and the Hourglass Estate Cabernet. So um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, HG3 as an introduction to tasting these wines, and then I think Tony will kind of take the floor and talk to you more about the winemaking techniques and and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if this came through in the earlier part of the presentation or not. 2012 is our first vintage with Tony um, uh, as the full-time winemaker. So Tony helped me finish the 2010s and 11s, and then in 2012, um, he was uh, fully in charge, and, and um, these are these are his beauties, sort of soup to nuts. And uh, we could talk a little bit later about you know, some of you may be interested in how you make a winemaker change and what goes into that thought process. And Tony and I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit if that interests you. Um, and um, it was definitely um, something that loomed large in my mind relative to. Um, kind of evolving the program at Hourglass and sort of where we had been, where we wanted to go. So that might be a topic if you guys are interested, we can we can vamp on that a little bit. Um, the first one in the flight, HG3, is a blend and it is non-estate. It's the only non-estate one we do. It is our first attempt at a second label. Um, and Tony can talk more about this, but um, Tony's blending techniques uh, were a little bit different than what we had done under Bob Foley's watch um, in the previous years. Bob was a fan of keeping the lots separate until right before bottling and doing the final blending um, before bottling. Tony likes to approach his, um, his blending much earlier in the cycle, like right after malolactic fermentation. So two, three months in after primary fermentation is over, Tony's already beginning to assemble his thoughts on how the blend should come together. Um, and you might ask him about that because it's, I think it's kind of interesting, his approach. Um, what that means for us is that, you know, the obvious lots when in that preliminary phase of blending go together and they become the core of the, the, the program, but there are all <coughs> perimeter lots that don't make the core that for a variety of different reasons. And we evaluate those lots through the whole aging process and, and as they become appropriate to blend, then they will get um, blended into the core lot. But what we're finding is that at the very tail end, we have more sort of odds and ends left over, really high quality wines, but um, they didn't make the final blend for whatever reason. So HD3 became our, our vehicle to address that issue um, to be able to take the declassified lots and then other cool odds and ends that we find um, around the valley from friends of ours and so forth that we think might make a good blend and we put those together to create HG3 and I, I think it turned out um, pretty cool. Tony, do you want to talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, so uh, in 2012 we had a lot of, you know, we have all five Bordeaux varietals at Blue Line and sometimes Malbec, which is, you know, one of the main proponents or components of this wine, um, you can never, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's one of those things you can never have enough of or you have too much of it. It's never a happy medium. And 12 was that vintage where it just the Malbec really wasn't working within the, the blends. Whereas 13 and 14, you know, subsequently, I think you guys are going to see that we use Malbec a lot more. It can be very fickle and it made very nice, fresh, you know, robust wines, but it didn't work well in the blends, especially the Blue Line Cabernet which is where it goes normally. So the HG3 is the backbone of that, plus some young vine Merlot. Uh, going to the blending, I believe in the Bordeaux method of blending. I think California, oftentimes, we confuse ourselves with Napa Valley. You know, we all love drinking Burgundy wines, <coughs> but, um, you know, we are a 20, 20 acre, correct? Mm -hmm. 20, uh, 24 acres. 24 acre between, between the two states. Piece of property, but 20, Blue Line's 20 acres, 20 acres yeah. and, you know, 
that would be 10 hectares. There's no, there's no vineyard in Burgundy that somebody owns 10 hectares of. I would say Claude de Bajot might be the largest vineyard to reach for, but the reality is we all sometimes fall into the love of, oh, let's keep everything separate because we're a single vineyard wine producer. But in essence, Blue Line Estate Cabernet is our single vineyard. So we use all five varietals to blend the best Blue Line Estate Cabernet. I like to get them together early, a la Bordeaux. You know, when you're at Latour, Lafitte, Mouton, wherever you visit or wherever you might fancy yourself in Bordeaux, they blend those wines after Mallow and March because their goal is to craft the best estate wine possible. And if the lots are great and they're dense and rich, they'll go together early. And I always say it's a stew philosophy. You know, stew tastes better two days later than it does the day you make it, or pasta sauce, or anything like that. And because of that, I think the board, you know, the blend uh, with lots of density wrapped around, uh, fruit density wrapped around that center core. And some of the lots that didn't make it um, don't have quite that level of concentration, quite that level of density. But um, nonetheless, I'm still pretty happy with the way that turned out. Yeah. I think one of the things we'll talk about, Jeff and I talked about why I sort of came on board is, I think one of the biggest misnomers of the last five to ten years in Napa Valley and California in general was alcohol levels. And I think what people tend to forget is, is acidity levels. Acidity plays just as big a part as the alcohol does. And I've had unbalanced wines at 12 and a half, 13. I think it's more. I think it's, I think it's everything. If you don't have acidity, you can hide, you know, the alcohol richness, but you still need to have balance. And I think people forget about that and they, they only focus on the alcohol, but not, well, maybe it's the acidity that's throwing the wine off, you know, and maybe that's why it tastes this way, not because of the level of the alcohol. So Jeff and I are really keep an eye on alcohol, or so alcohol levels, but also acidity levels. Most of the, you know, we do at times have added that, you know, I try not to, I try to do as minimalistic stuff as possible, do everything before, at fermentation. Uh, I think everybody understands here out there that fermentation is the most um, aggressive or, na or violent act in all of nature. So anything after that, I, I, I consider a, a bit. lion eating an elk or a, a <laughs> ebu or something. Nah, like that. no way. More violent. No way. <laughs> no, if, I mean you're basically talking about having an atmosphere of Mars while you're in your winery. So it's it's so I try to get everything done before then and really try to get everything precise because anything I feel after fermentation that you do to the wines is almost damaging the wine because the wine's done. You put it in barrels, try to rack it minimally, touch it as the least amount possible, and do those things. So. Kimberly, do we have any questions yet from the group? Uh, we've had a couple. Um, we think that your internet connection is possibly a little slow here because it's um, we're having you know connections with people signing on and off. Okay. Um, Meg Maker was just wanting to confirm uh, vineyard acreage, and it's not on both of the tech sheets as far as both properties. Just to yeah, vineyard on. vineyard acreage at um, Blue Line Estate is twenty planted acres. It's forty one acres in total, but twenty planted acres. To all five Bordeaux varietals, um, and the Hourglass Estate is four planted acres, 100% Cabernet. Any other questions? All right. Um, you know, we could talk a little bit about. Um, I'm sorry, there was a question. Yes. Yeah, okay. There was question. Uh, from Wine Anthropology. It says it stands to reason that earlier blending equals better integration. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, let's hold on. Let's yeah. read the question. So, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm just answering. This. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was: Does early does early blending equal better integration? Tell yeah, me. I do. I think early blending to me over just the course I, where I started from and where I mentored and worked at as a young wine cellar at to being a winemaker, I just come to believe that the earlier blending makes better wines. And not everybody agrees with that. Everybody does it differently here. But for me and how I've seen. You know, as my my style evolved, I like getting wines together as early as possible. I often find that if you keep wines separate longer, you, you almost find the wine somewhat to fall apart. Maybe some wine needs a little more tannin, and it could have taken a level, you know, even better than what it is. It's a sum of its parts, I guess you could say. Where one wine might not have the tannin to age, so you leave it 18 months in the barrel by itself, so it falls apart. But another wine might have been too tannic, and if you blended those two together, you might have made a better wine. Uh, but you know, all under the thing of we keep everything separate till the end. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I understand in Burgundy and you reach for Romy Saint Pivon with different wines separate. And I think sometimes we fall prey to that. But then you would market them separately. Right. And we, I think Napa Valley falls prey to that. That well, then when it's 16 months, I'm going to throw the wine together. It, to me, I like getting it together as early as possible. It doesn't mean you can't change. You know, at times Jeff and I will keep small lots out because maybe it didn't work in the blend, but we have a gut feeling that it's going to work in the end. 
and sometimes your gut's right, sometimes your gut's wrong, but yeah. you wouldn't throw the baby out in the bath water, so to speak. You know, you want to let give yourself a chance to do it. So it's it's nice to have a couple. It's a little salt and pepper in the in the uh, cupboard if you need it right at the tail end. Yeah. Um, you know, because sometimes things don't evolve the way you, you anticipate they will, and you want to be able to um, bend and weave at, at the very end. But I think that this is a great question um, in terms of integration. And there's another concept here that integration reminds me of, and that is precision. And so I think that this strikes actually to the core of some of the, the reasons why we went about the business of, of changing winemakers. And um, um, a lot of, you know, in, in, in Bob Foley's world, you had Hourglass, you had Switchback, you had Barbara Foley, Pride, Paloma, and so forth. And then a couple others like Red Hook and, and, and so forth. Bob had a lot on his plate um, toward the tail end of our relationship. And Bob is, you know, one of the iconic, um, phenomenal, transcendent winemakers of our, of our generation. Both Tony and I are huge fans of Bob's work. But at a certain point, you just don't have enough headspace to, to be able to, to share it all the way around. And, and winemaking is one of those things where it's on its schedule and not on your schedule. So the decisions need to be made in certain time and order based on what the wine needs and not based on what the schedule provides for and so forth. So being able to evolve our program um, to the next level, to me, was about being able to um, execute a higher level of precision and certainly integration Structural integration speaks directly to uh, precision in winemaking, and sort of stylistically, where we had gone, you know, our glass was part of the sort of that game-changing, stylistic-changing uh, pendulum swing that began in the early '90s, um, with ripeness being sort of the driving factor of that, and. And if you can gain a little bit more phenolic ripeness because we have the climate to be able to do that, and you do, and the wines are better, hell, that's great. Why don't we try a little bit more of that? And the wines are a little bit better, ooh, that's really good. I like that. And so you kind of keep clocking out on the, on the spectrum, on that pendulum spectrum, and one day you find yourself sort of out on the outer edges of that, saying to yourself, well, is this you know, the best of where we have come from? And um, I really felt like, um, though we were making very high quality wines that were very dense and very rich, by the time we were sort of out at the furthest extremes of that spectrum, that, and, you know, the trade-offs in life. So to get out there, you're gaining density, richness, um, but you're losing some vitality, some energy, some acid, um, and some expression of minerality, uh, which both of our sites have um, uh, really, I think, pretty profound um, executions of minerality when you're allowed to show, um, and so as you as you roll out on that on that spectrum and you get out to this uber richness uber ripe uh, spectrum, these wines began to me to feel a little monochromatic, and they were sort of losing their their tensional edge, and they were rich, which is great, and I like richness, and richness is really important. Tony Tony will speak quite a bit about his love of rich wines and, and density and so forth, but we had been sort of floating out in this sort of extreme zone, and I really felt that, that our wines expressed themselves better when we pulled that pendulum back toward the center a bit and try to find that holy grail somewhere between the center point and that sort of ultra-modern, ultra-rich um, um, extreme. So, so what is that? Um, it's energy, it's vitality, um, it's lift, it's tensional pull on the richness, um, and it's about brightness, um, but it's also about the structural integrity of the wine. And this is something that Tony um, has brought to this winemaking that I think will be evident as we taste through these wines. It certainly is evident as I taste through 2012, 2013, and now the 2014 vintage under Tony's um, direction what I'm finding is that the center structure of the wine, the core structure of the wine, is more tightly integrated, more tightly knitted together, um, and that's going to allow us to hang more things on that center, and it's also going to give the wine significantly longer um, aging, so aging potential. So 
Um, barrel aging and how Tony approaches his blending is part of that puzzle. Um, how Tony approaches fermentations is quite different than we have done in the past. Um, it's about setting color and tannin together and how to do that. When it's done really well, that ratio has a lot to do with the center structure and integration of the wine. And how we make our picking decisions. Um, do we wait until really late into the season and pick a block all in one day? Or do we maybe take that same block that we used to pick on a single day and chop it up into a couple of smaller picks and make several wines out of that and then blend those wines back together? And that's basically where we have gotten. I think our winemaking has gotten a little bit more complicated in some respects, and, um, and that's a good thing. Um, it gives us more component parts to play with, more components to wind together to create more layers, um, and to set better, better uh, uh, structural integrity of the wines. So um, all of that you know, leads us to then again this first wine, which are sort of the outliers, the outtakes of that process. So shall we move on now? Yeah, to, good, I think it's a good segue because the second wine is the is the dad. I mean, <clears throat> this is the, the lots that were left over from making the second wine. Yes, yeah. so. we do have a couple questions. Oh, okay. okay, more questions. Yes. More questions. So, uh, favorite food pairings for both of you for the Hourglass Estate 2012 Blue Line? Sorry, Blue Line. Favorite food pairings with this? I um, I, I love lamb, and I think that um, the 2012 Blue Line Estate cab is going to pair really beautifully with lamb, maybe a little um, mint and basil pesto to top off that lamb. Yeah, I think it tastes pretty darn good. Um, and a, a lamb loin. I actually love taking yeah. taking the loin and giving it a quick, hot sear, um, so it's nice and um, medium rare on the center, and then topping that with a little mint and uh, basil pesto. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Hanger steak, now I do hanger steak. It's got a nice little, almost like a juniper berry, not not so bitter, you know, quinone, or quinone, uh, quinone uh, but, or quinine, I guess you could say. But it's almost like an underripe raspberry. So I think it'll go really well with meat. I mean, it literally says well off of that. Total production on HG3? The total production on HG3 is about 900 cases. More questions? Total production on all of them, actually. Uh, everything in total, mm, thirty-five hundred cases. Probably five. Uh, by, uh, about nine hundred for this. About nine hundred for this. About six hundred. Uh, this being <laughs> Blue Line State Cabernet. Excuse me. Hourglass Estate Cabernet about six hundred cases. And HG three about nine hundred. And then we also do Merlot, which is about nine hundred cases. We do Cab Franc, which. Maybe the, the rock star of, of the Blue Line Estate. Absolutely amazing wine. That site is just so beautifully set up to execute Cap Franc at a really high level, but we only do about 125 cases of that. And then we will do a little, a little bit of Malbec just for fun um, because it's quite unique um, by itself. And we get these really tangy red fruits, raspberry, strawberry. Um, kind of a medium body wine, which is really kind of a lot of fun. It's, it's a great food wine. simple aromatics with a uh, low uh, weight. It's just really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so Blue Line Estate Cabernet. Um, the thing that excites me about the Blue Line um, Vineyard, and I, I think that this is the wine, to me, of all of the wines that Tony has has uh, put his stamp on in our in our portfolio, that we've seen the biggest lift in terms of qualitative delivery. And um, what Blue Line is a property that is in a slightly warmer pocket of Napa Valley. It's in the northeastern section up toward Calistoga and in, the, in Dutch Henry Canyon. And it is a little bit warmer. It's certainly a lot warmer than the Hourglass Estate site. And it's a vineyard that if you're not careful with how you manage it, the, the phenolics can run on you pretty quickly. The sugars can run on you really quickly. And so you really have to stay on top of it. And when, the, when, when it does run, that's when you get into these really big, heavy, almost sappy uh, wines. And we had picked it out there a little bit with, um, with Blue Line Cab. And the charm of this vineyard is when you dial it in right and you make the right picking calls, um, the soils that are the underpinning of Blue Line are, um, it's an old 
gravel bed. These are called Cortina soils. And um, they're the formation of the two blue line streams that run down the canyons above us through the property, and they have essentially meandered for thousands of years, creating this upturned riverbed that the, that the vineyard is planted on. The magic of that site is the minerality of it. The, the, the cobble and sand and gravel of this site is um, really, really cool. And um, when you can dial back the phenolic mass of the wine, then all of a sudden this minerality begins to show through. And so I get um, almost a crushed stone characteristic aromatically uh, when we can dial back the phenolic mass. And it doesn't smell just like blackberries or, or um, fruit aromas. And it's, it's as if you were to go out into the vineyard, pick up two of these field stones, river stones, and crush them together and smell that. You get that sort of um, that sort of crushed yeah, stone. It's record. a lot like Dr. Crane for it's the yeah. same type of soil that Dr. Crane and Las Piedras has for uh, Bastofford, where those wines are very you know, fruit forward. There's always a mineralic, mineralic component to it. Yeah. And I really dig it. I mean, this wine, you know, I love that about this wine. You can pick it out all the flight. I know Audra, our sales director, can always peg this wine right away. Yeah. She goes, oh, there it is. It's the rocks. You know, yeah. it's rocks and gravel. Which I love about A little graphite it. in there. Um, and and that sort of crushed stone characteristic. And then the crushed stone uh, minerality will carry through onto the palate. The, um, the vibrancy that you get in this wine um, has something to do with acid, but it has a lot to do with that minerality. So that, that buzz that you get, that tingle that you get in the back mid palate, that tends to be more of a mineral driven um, energy source in wine rather than an acid driven energy source. The acid's gonna get you on the tip of the tongue and around the sides and so forth. But that back mid palate really is more of a mineral driven thing and you you can taste that sort of crushed stone back there and then you get this little electric charge to it <coughs> and um and and what i love about this is now that now that tony's kind of throttled this back a bit that minerality is really becoming prominent again in the wine and i think it's um really um, a testament to being able to show off a little of the terroir of that vineyard site so thank you very much. Oh, it's a great vineyard. I mean, I, I told Jeff when I first came to Vineyard, hopefully all of you who've been there can understand this. It's a beautiful estate. It's really what made me want to come work for Jeff was the hourglass estate had already achieved so much in the wine business with, with Bob and, and so forth, but really being able to craft something from scratch and really, I mean, the wines had already been well received in the press, but I really thought we could take it to the next level with Blue Line Cavern. That's what really excited me. And I think some people are very, I'm very driven by making wines, you know, you know, going to a winery that's already achieved so much is not as exciting to me as being able to build something from scratch, from you know zero to a hundred, or, or even from twenty miles an hour to a hundred. Um, that's exciting to me. Taking a property to the next level and establishing it within the wine business as as a, as a reference point wine that is what excites me. And I think Blue Line has the ability. Looking at the people who've looked at this property, I mean, I know I've been stopped by Bartarajo on the street. Um, and he said, you know, I should have bought that property. Just I should, I just didn't know why I didn't. And then Rick Foreman approached Jeff and I and said, I tried to buy that property in the seventies, you know, but then the, the, the moment at the time would not sell to me. So I bought my other property at Lower and Allen Mountain. So to hear those two people who I have the utmost respect for say that, obviously <coughs> Jeff, you know, Jeff, you never do anything else right. I like you did that. So, <laughs> you know, know, it's, just, it's just a beautiful piece of property. I think if you were to talk to Audra, Jeff, myself, or anybody who works here, this property really is what fueled us. The four acres is our amazing yeah. as a property that wine next but this is really the future for us so um, more questions yeah two questions um Tony given your experience at Plump Jack would you ever consider um screw cap for these wines you know oh hold on uh, just so everybody can hear yeah. um given Tony's background at Plump Jack the question is uh would Tony ever consider screw, screw cap for uh for the hourglass wines absolutely I mean I, I learned a lot about it you know, I took the job at Plump Jack it was very much do like screw caps like oh sure I just really wanted the job at the time <laughs> it really wasn't right if I knew it or not over the course of the next nine years we did so much studies on it that it really does make a difference wines are fresher they're fruitier however you know right now I think we're just really trying to focus on on bringing a level of quality that this is stayed up to the next level and that would be a decision that Jeff and I would come up with in a couple of years but we know we know we have to crawl before we walk and I think we're still in the crawling stage of the blue line I mean to take a, you know, hourglass state was a 400 case project, and then we decided to add 20 acres to that. 
and to be able to engulf that and be able to have it running smoothly, those are the type of decisions that you're able to make once the winery's up and running and you can feel comfortable making the next step. And I, I can honestly, I know Jeff and I have conferences like this every week. I don't know if we're there yet to be able to say that blue line's running smoothly. I think we're there. The wines are better than ever. But I don't, I'm not scared of using screw caps whatsoever. So. I do think that um, screw caps, and, and Tony has a way deeper knowledge of this than I do. So I'm probably jumping into an area I shouldn't. But um, um, I, am a, I am an aesthetics guy, and uh, aesthetics are really important. And I, and I do think that... Um, the the mental um, triggering of how I enjoy wine starts with the aesthetic pull of that cork and the sound that it makes, and that whole um, that whole sensation I think um, to me plays in my mind as to how it sets up my enjoyment of what I'm going to have, and the crack of a um, of a um, screw cap um, leaves me a little cold. So um, from an aesthetic standpoint, um, I find it to be a tough leap. Um, from a wine quality standpoint, um, that can be argued. I think, it's, I think it's a matter of style to a certain extent. I, I think there is an osmotic transfer that um, corks um, that do supply. And so then, then the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And that's relative to how you like to enjoy your wines. If fruit vibrancy and freshness is of paramount importance through the life of the wine, then I think screw caps actually probably do supply a really interesting um, option. I personally love tertiary characteristics in older wines. And so um, I'd be... I'd be really curious to want to go back and tell me maybe this is an exercise you can walk me through and taste some of those older wines and see, you know, do they develop the tertiary characteristics or is it more about the freshness and vibrancy and so forth? And, and you know, I, I kind of think if you want to drink a fresh wine, drink it young. If you want the experience of an aged wine, then, then cork may be a better solution. I can't answer that right now. Did you? Um, <laughs> we did so much research on it, but I have the answers. It's just, I agree. You can't argue aesthetics. It's almost like, you know, I say to people, you know, what, what are the uh, three things you never ask at a very high-end wine dinner? You know, what's your religion? Don't discuss religion. Don't discuss <laughs> religion, <laughs> politics, or do you like cork or speak out? <laughs> you know, he's always joking wine dinners for plump jack because it just would always elicit a, either a positive or negative response. Uh, I had a great experience with them. I was very, very shocked by how well they worked in all the research. But again... I can't take my eye off the ball right now. That's the next level for us. I think right now I need to focus on making these wines reference point. Like I said before, reference point wines for Napa Valley. When all of you want to grab something, you want to grab hourglass. At that point, Jeff and I can even discuss taking the next step of an aesthetics issue. Because in the truth, they are similar, but um, I need to really focus on, on this. I will say this, you know, we do use a different grade of cork for the estate versus the blue line and everything else. And it's, it's an 85 cent cork versus a dollar thirty cork. There's a huge difference in size of corks and stuff like that um, that we've noticed. Uh, but Plum Jack, as you know, has not got 100% cork or screw cap on any other reserve wines. So I think they like that as well. So they're not ready to buy any either. So, you know, I, Gordon was very adamant about it when he was there. But I know John Connolly, the general manager, liked it the way it was. So... New, new question. Yes, and while we're on the topic of ageability, um, could you please address the ageability and aging trajectory of all three wines? Okay, so can we address the aging trajectory of all three of these wines? Um, I can speak more conclusively to Hourglass Estate because we have a longer history with that. Um, I'd be speculating a little bit more with Blue Line, but I think we can make some, some speculations on that. Um, first of all, I think these wines will age a lot longer than people think they will. Um, I think Hourglass wines as a whole age longer than people think they will. And I think these wines specifically that Tony is now making will age even longer. And it has to do with precision of the core of the wines and how Tony approaches setting color and tannin and um, resolving the, um, in, the integrated structure of the wine. And to me, ageability has probably more to do with the integrated structure of the wine than it does with its acid levels or its alcohol levels or its pH or all of that other stuff. 
you know, color color is everything to do with ageability. Color and tannin level. Uh, it's funny. I mean, people who drink Barolo, there's no color, tons of tannin. You know, it's a very interesting wine. Or you drink California Cabernet, which is the exact opposite, tons of color, tons of tannin. So it's all about how you manage the tannin levels, you know, in the wine. The, the tannin, 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 the color ratio. Yeah, and how you know if you color vines to tannin, and it's 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 a long drawn out conversation for this type of setting. Uh, but my goal is to bind color early to tannin, because then the, the tannins will roll over your palate rather than stick to your palate. It's like ball bearings. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but that's be, that, if you do that and you bind that color, the color can never fall out. All of us have seen tartrates at the bottom of a, of a bottle of wine, and that's because that color doesn't have anything to bind to. It's binding the tannin and falling out. Whereas when you bind a color molecule to a tannin, it's going to be in suspension for almost ever. And so that's why the wines age extremely well. So Bordeaux's so, been doing this for years. This is not. This is new for Napa Valley. So, so, so relative to aging capability with our glass estate, which we have more um, history with, what I can tell you is that there tends to be an arc that has about a seven-year inflection point. So, when the wines are younger, uh, they tend to be a little more fruit-driven, and um, they're very fleshy, and and it's all about primary fruit characteristics aromas, uh, mouthfeel, and so forth. As the wine approaches year seven from the vintage date, then you start to get um, some compression that happens where the, where the wines tend to kind of lose their baby fat a little bit. So they, they shed a little of the fruit fleshiness and they, they focus down on the center core of the wine. So they, they become a little bit more linear on your palate maybe a little less um, width and a little less density, but they then elongate out um, in, a, in a very subtle arc on your palate. And then aromatically, you begin to see the, uh, the tertiary characteristics yeah. of age begin to show up at about year seven. So cedar, cigar box, um, saddle leather, uh, those kinds of elements uh, begin to show, at, whereas before that, it's a little bit more about fruit aromas, Spice aromas, barrel aromas, but primary so primary aromas of you know raspberry, black cherry, whatever. Then you start getting the secondary, tertiary. Yeah. Also, I mean the way we age the wines now in the cellar, uh, we're very I'm very aerophobic. I don't like a lot of air in the young in the wine young life. So we're oxygen phobic. So I tend to lease stir, and what lease stir does with these early wines, I know I actually lease stir red wines. It's, it, I mean I think some of you probably most all of you out there have probably heard of this. We lease stir our red wines probably every other week, and what it does is it scavenges oxygen. And I leave the wine on leaves almost until February when we blend the first wines. Then if Mallow finishes, I will not sulfur the wines. I'll leaves stir to keep the oxygen down. Because so what the leaves will do is they'll scavenge the oxygen, bring it to the bottom. It makes the wines somewhat dumb for them. So we Jeff and I were just talking about this earlier. It makes it you know dumb for almost the first year of its life because the wines don't have that blast of oxygen to build aromatic compounds. But what it does is it gives the wine a ton of ageability. And it does what happens now. I mean, you know, we're tasting the wines now. These wines are exploding in the bottle. So it's like that big breath in the bottle. <coughs> and the wines are gaining fatness and weight. And it's funny, like, the big two critics were here recently, they both said to me, these wines have put on so much weight in the last year. I'm so confused. They're so much bigger now. I'm like, well, yeah, I, I lease stir. I keep the wine on lees. And, and it's, it's, it's a trick, twofold. The, the yeast breaks down and gives you nano proteins, gives you more density and richness in the mid palate. But it also scavenges oxygen. So the wines are almost dumb. For the first year, it's very. It's a trick they use in Burgundy and so forth. Too. It took me a little getting used to the first year because I'm I'm used to you know, having this you know blast of primary fruit aromas straight out of the barrel um, in the first year and and some of these wines and I'm I'm an aroma guy. I'm a texture, texture guy. So. Texture guy, aroma guy, and so um, in you know the first year that Tony and I were working together, there were two things that concerned me a little bit. One was I was getting um, an enormous amount of barrel. Um, aromas and so forth that were that to me were sitting on top of the wines and distracting me from what I felt was the sort of terroir uh, driven characteristics that I associated with those wines. Um, so that was a little distracting and, and then the other thing was they just they felt they they kind of were dumb and they, they aromatically they were not expressive and they were a little dumbed down and Tony kept saying relax it's okay because essentially what we're doing is we're, we're first setting the structural core of the wine. And if we do that well, that will create integration. It will bind up a lot of things. And then later is when you're going to get these really profoundly aromatic wines. And, and, he, and it was true to form. I was really blown away um, in these 2012 especially 
after getting through the first year and then seeing how they progressed through the next six or eight or ten months um, in barrel was really magical to, to see that happen. So it, it was a cool thing. Well, and everybody thinks they can use 100%. You know, we use on the estate, which is the last one we'll roll into. It's 100% new wood. And uh, Jeff was so worried that the line was so like cedar plank or, you yep. know. And I was like, no, we use new wood differently here. We use it as a binding agent to color again. And my goal is, you know, when we do ML and barrel, the, the malolactic bacteria itself will eat the new wood, you know, the, the sugar, the wood sugars, and will actually ferment and then it'll drop to the bottom. So your wines tend to be less oaky. And I don't think anybody who tastes the last wine, if you guys are tasting with I think they are tasting with us, correct? Yeah. You're yes. tasting with us, just making sure yeah. they're not yes, talking they about are. it. They <laughs> <are>. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, they like, have no idea. We also about. have a couple of comments. So, good, yeah, go ahead. No, let's hear the comments. A but. few things. One is um, obviously the. Uh, People, someone might ask you to speak a little bit about Cabernet Franc, knowing that it's not in this lineup, mm -hmm. but just to talk a little bit about Blue Line Cab Franc, um, and then... Um, and also the Petit Verdot. There's a lot of um, kind of interest in sure. why I use the 9%. Um, uh, I'll speak, I can speak to that. And and the, 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 so yeah, the, the questions were, speak a little bit to the usage of Petit Verdot, which is reasonably new for us. We planted Petit Verdot and 2007, 2008. So we have just been using it over the last couple of years, which Tony's a big fan of. Um, and then the second question is, uh, talk a little bit about Cap Franc, even though we're not um, tasting it today, sure. and I would be happy to Well, do let's that. talk about the Petit first, because it's in both, well, it's actually in the list, I'm sorry, it's in the HG3 and it's in the blue line. Um, Petit Bordeaux, you know, in Bordeaux, they use it in the best vintages. Usually they can't get it right, and it adds color, it adds density, and um, here, okay, yeah. um, so it adds color and density. In Napa Valley, we can get it right, and so, but the problem is with Petit Verdot, it's a weapon of mass destruction. If you use over a certain percentage of it, it just wipes the wine out. All you taste and is it grows, too. And it, does, it, it does, it does, it does, like it yeah. just, it just, it's all Petit Verdot. I made a wine at Pump Jack in one vintage that was 19% Petit Verdot we grow for, we co-fermented it. And that was ended up being the 09 Reserve, and I remember to this day, I mean, both critics were like, what in the heck? You know, like, <laughs> we love it, but it doesn't smell like any of the reserves. said, it was the best wine, it's what we did. So, really, I think the window is about six to ten percent on Petit Verdot, no more. And but but it's magical in that sense that it adds color, it adds tannin, it adds density, and that's what you're trying to build when you build a wine. It's funny we're using now more than ever. I'm involved in phenolic research with, with a bunch of my other winemaking buddies. And we talk about it a lot. Every variety has its reason. Now you understand why Bordeaux has what they have there: Malbec, Merlot, Petit Verdot. Cab Franc, which we'll talk about in a second, so forth. They all play a, a, a component to the wines. Um, and Petit Verdot for us is sort of the backbone. Our cabs can be very luscious and rich, but that Petit Verdot just comes in and gives you backbone. And it's you know, it's like Petit Syrah in a sense. It's almost black as night. So a little goes a long way, but, but it works great, really great well. Great density, great it texture. Does. It's almost like Petit Syrah. It's almost like yeah. a, black, you know, a black, uh, black hole of a wine. But it yeah, works really Petit well. Syrah gets used quite a bit. It doesn't get talked about that much, but it gets used quite a bit as a blending component, very much in the same way as um, uh, Petit Verdot. So, um, Petit Verdot has to be thinnest, too. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little green one. I mean, small green is what it means. Petit Syrah tends to be a little bit more, have a little higher acid, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So, yeah. and then with Cabernet Franc, I mean, and I, I kind of, it's kind of like the question I got asked at Plum Jack, you know, why do you work with screw caps? Oh, sure, I love them. You know, Jeff said, like Cabernet Franc said, it's my favorite variety of love. Um, so I have to be honest with you. I, took, I, took, I, said, I said, I love Cabernet Franc to get the job. Um, but everybody has to understand that, you know, when I, when I came up in the valley in the mid-90s, I started working here in 93, that was the first wave of Cabernet Franc. Tony Soder was the superstar winemaker within Napa Valley, and he loves Franc. To this day, he still believes one of the best varietals. And so everybody kind of followed Tony and planted Cabernet Franc everywhere you shouldn't. So I had a lot of bad Cabernet Francs, but Cabernet Franc is really site specific. Oh yeah, it's like Sauvignon really Blanc. You want green, you want green Cabernet Franc grown by the river. You know, <laughs> it, well, I mean Cabernet Franc yeah. and Sauvignon Blanc are the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, so that'll tell you something. And so it, it can be a very green. You know, Jeff and I jokingly say that green bean salad, three bean salad. 
But our franc is ripe enough, the rocks, you get more of the ripe bank Cabernet franc. You get more of the, sort of the gunpowder, yeah. flint, a ro- you know, violet. And, it, violets. and, and it, it can be a complete wine. I mean, Cabernet franc is a classic donut wine. Big in the ends and, you know, hollow in the middle. You know, hence why it works well in blend. It's very aromatic. But on our side, it works very well. Now, Jeff and I have come to the conclusion that we need to blend some Cabernet in. Not a lot, 10 to 15% to give it a little more fatness and up and maybe fill in that mid palate a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's 24 year old vines. So it's a very unique, one of a kind clone. And on that property, the Eastern Hills or the Eastern part of the valley where it grows best, that would be where Dalla Valley is or Oakville Ranch or where we are, it grows really, really well there. So that's why Cap so Franc right. has kind of two paths that it can go down. And it's a, it's a great varietal that generates quite a bit of pyrazine. Obviously, pyrazine is that chemical that gives you the green bell pepper. Um, characteristic. It, it is what gives green bell peppers their, their aroma and flavor and so forth, which is just fine in a green bell pepper. It's challenging in a, in a bottle of wine. Um, so cool climate and warm climate, um, the Cap Franc is really the, 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 the dif- differentiating uh, pass. Cooler climate, uh, you can't get the pyrazine out. Um, so in order to get pyrazine, pyrazine to, to translocate out, you have to have uh, warmth, you have to have some, some heat, you have to have a long growing season, um, and I think you need some hormonal triggers to the plant um, also to yeah, help. Yeah, sunlight on the clusters. That's it. You, so you that's sunlight the on the clusters. Trigger. But I also think that, I think that really dry feet and gravelly soils have a, um, have a role to play mm-hmm. relative to getting the pyrazine to, to, um, to vacate. And so uh, we happen to have all of those characteristics at the Blue Line site. It's, it's um, perfectly suited, especially the little zones that we have planted to Cap Franc. They're in the old river wash soils there. It's almost like Chateauneuf down there. I mean, it's just crawly and gravelly. And you, you take a shovel and you put it in, and it's just all sand and gravel that comes up. So it's, it's perfectly suited. Um, so site selection is, is critical in terms of growing great Cap Franc. And then, and then, you know, do you want to, to do more of a warm climate Cap Franc or a cool climate Cap Franc? Warm climate Cap Franc is going to give you, you know, if you can get the pyrazine out, then you're going to get more of the violet side of the, of the aromatic um, profile. You're going to get um, sometimes a really high tone band of, of, of rose, uh, kind of rose petal, dried mm-hmm. rose petals. Um, you get some... Uh, sort of roasted coffee. When we do our malolactic fermentation, there's sometimes when I go buy the the um, Cap Franc barrels and it'll smell like I'm in a roastery. It, it, it's got that sort of, which is an amazing thing. And that's a varietal thing. That's not a barrel thing. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's uh, and then and then there's sometimes when we'll go by and we'll get a little uh, jalapeno characteristic, which a little bit of that is cool, but a lot of it is not cool. So. Um, it's something that is a finic- finicky grape. He doesn't like herbal no. characteristics. I don't mind it. Look, I like old, I like old Cabernet. I like it when it's in, you know, it's like, I love them, but not in my wine. Is that yeah. not just like bread. I love it. It's not in my wine. So, so anyway, um, our little, our little um, rant on Cap Franc. I'm a, I'm a big fan um, when it's done in a very modern um, sort of warm, a warm climate environment where you can get those high tone. Uh, floral stuff. That to me is is wine at its most enticing, exotic uh, um, uh, state. And and sometimes we get there, and we're really excited when we do. 2012 Cap Franc is pretty brilliant, and it gets into that space. And I think Tony's it's really too. I'm yeah, as well. Tony's really. Um, I know he wasn't a fan of Cap Franc coming on board, but I think I think we we turned him a little bit. Anyway. I still drink it. That's not true. I drink Chinon. <laughs> I, I, I drink Chinon. There's a whole new wave of Chinons coming out that tastes like New World wine, so it can be done there as well. So, so um, finish just finishing up with our last state. Did yeah. we cover that pretty well? I know we're kind of winding yes. down on time. Mm-hmm. More questions? Yeah. Um, could you talk about some replantings that went on on Blue Line and uh, how you know what the what the ages are of both of plants. Yeah, so, so uh, we've been asked to talk a little bit about the replantings at Blue Line. Um, they started in 2007. We bought the ranch in 2006. We knew that there was a, a fair amount of eutypa, um, which is an airborne pathogen that gets in the pruning wounds. Um, dead arm. Yeah, dead arm disease. Australians call it dead arm. So basically it creates a knot in the cardiovascular system and it redirects all of the, uh, the, the plant flow. So, so all of the stuff... Uh, all of the, the nutrients and fluids and so, so forth that are going through the, the middle part of the, the cordon, for example, get backed up and they get pushed back into the rest of the plant. So everything beyond the knot dies off 
and then all of that energy and nutrients get shot back into the core of the plant, so you get a lot of lateral growth and all kinds of nonsense. So um, we knew there was a fair amount of eutype, but we didn't know how pervasive it was. We went through our first harvest in 2006 with the existing plants that we had, and we realized in a hurry, holy shit, um, this is a problem. And so we ended up pulling out half of the um, vineyard at Blue Line, which was a reasonably painful thing to, to do. We, we had sort of hit the high water mark for price per acre when we bought it in 2006, uh, and then discovered that we had to plunk down another $70,000 an acre to replant it. So that was not any, and, and the loss of production that that meant, but it was the right thing to do. So we did it, and, um, and we started in 2007 with a series of, of replants where we pulled uh, various blocks out over the course of a couple of years, and in doing so, we added um, several new clones of Cabernet. So when we bought the ranch, we had um, clone 337, and we had C clone on the property. And just, no, no, I'm sorry. We had clone 337, and we had clone 4. Those clones worked really well together. Uh, but there were some favorite clones we didn't have, uh, C clone being the one that we really wanted. Hourglass Estate is 100% C-Clone, and it's Tony and my, one of our favorite clones to work with. It's, it's great to work with. It's Heritage Clone. So we'll talk, we'll talk a little more about that. So we time. added that. We added uh, some more Clone 4, which we like quite a bit. We added Clone 7, and we added a uh, Clone 338. And so we now have a mix of Heritage Clones and um, Ontov mm -hmm. Clones. Um, Tony, I think, is, is a proponent of... You know, we, we, we go through phases in Napa Valley, and we're still learning as we go. So we started off with all of the heritage clones, which are the clones that had been here, you know, brought over, let's say, in the late 1800s, and then have field selected over the years. Um, Napa Valley started predominantly with those clones. And then there's a whole new, when, when we replanted after Blocks, right, there was a whole new um, movement of bringing on on top clones mm -hmm. from Europe, which are more modern clones. And we've had a whole experimentation period with those clones. Those clones are things like 337 or 338 or 191. Yeah. So these are, and, and I, Tony, would you say that your thought process is that maybe going back to the heritage clones is? You know, again, it's like you know, a Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir went since about three or four years before us. Um, yeah. Pinot winemakers tend to look for the holy grail, as they're always doing. So, whereas Napa Valley tends to always worry about these. It's always interesting. We always worry about these property worth worth clone budwood, and so Pinot Noir producers over in Mushroom River, Sonoma Coast, and everywhere else, you know, were the first to jump on these Antoff selections: six, six, seven, 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 one, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. La, 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 la. Eight to eight is the holy grail. So for them, that's um, that you couldn't get it for years. Then they started realizing that that's maybe what's pro pushing the alcohol levels up. That these clones weren't used to the area. They weren't acclimated. They weren't acclimated, so they made you rich, ripe fruit. They were interesting. So a lot of the cutting edge producers on the coast started going back to you know Mate Swan, um, you know Calera, uh, Swan Calera, Wente. whatever Wenty. Well, Wenty's she yeah, old vine Wenty for Chardonnay and stuff like that. Well, we were about five years behind that, so now we're looking at the new heritage clones and saying they're probably better for the site than, than the Antos selections are. We can pick at lower sugars with riper phenolics. Yeah. And so Jeff and I, and off the property where we are at Blue Line, the C clone which we planted and the four tend to show the best. Yeah. 337 is great, but it's, it's 337 tends to taste like everywhere the same. Big red fruit, really lush, really ripe. I tend to like 337 in a blend with heritage because heritage can be a little bit more classically structured California Cabernet. Yeah. So, but we're going to be planting more of it in the future. So, more we, questions? We had a long standing question about just a quick synopsis of your oak regime approach. Okay, a quick synopsis of Tony's oak regime. I'll keep it quick. Uh, we tend all French oak, thin stave chateau barrels, predominantly Sylvain, Terenceau, Darnajou. Darnajou tends to find its way all over the place as a spice, but I tend to use Sylvain as, or Sylvain as my main cooperage. A family-run business out of the right bank of Bordeaux. Uh, one of the first cooperages off the right bank of Bordeaux to actually sell barrels on the left bank, which is very hard to do if you know Bordeaux. Uh, Jean-Luc is a wonderful cooper. Uh, the barrels tend to be a little understated, uh, but they add a nice density and richness to them. That's why I like them. Terenceau tends to be a little bit more blousey, and Garnagey tend to just sort of mark the wine pretty heavily, but I like that as a sort of a, a, as an, an accent, accent spice. Yeah, as an accent. So... Yeah, and then the wine season barrels we rack every every three or four months, depending on, on timing. Uh, but I don't want the wine to taste excessively oaky. 
but I do like a presence of wood somewhere like secondary or tertiary when you're smelling the wine you get a little bit of hint of it sort of balance with the red and right red and black fruits it, so. it's sort of aromatically you want to have sort of up on the top of the bridge of your nose you want this band of floral characteristics and then that drifts into more of the fruit driven aromas and then below that are sort of the lower tone wood aromatics you want all of that integrated but um, but a little bit of that base note from yeah. the from the wood um, helps I think anchor the air. Yeah, you get a little bit of acid from the wood as well. So, and and then um, barrel aging time. Um, that's something that's changed a little bit too. We used to um, age all of our red wines for the same amount of, of time, and Tony came in and said, you know, I think some of the more delicate reds that we're doing. Um, may benefit from a little less barrel time. And so Merlot and Cab Franc, we've now cut down from a 22-month aging cycle down to, what, about 16 months? Uh, no, it's three, three months different, so 18, 19. Yeah. And the Cabernets are 2022. 20, Again, Merlot and Cab Cabernet Franc was <coughs> aromatic-driven. I was worried that we'd lose aromatics the longer we kept it in barrel. And Merlot tends to dry out if you keep it in barrels too long. So uh, I worked at Duck Horn for six years, so... Kind of got my hand with, had a little bit around Merlot, especially under. Cabernet. I really like I really like those moves. I think yeah. that, um, and especially like Merlot, when you talk about it drying out. You know, in the past I could see that inflection point where it was really juicy, and then all of a sudden it was more granular and burning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. bourbony. You know, yeah. we would actually at Duck Run at times bottle the Merlot before the Sauvignon Blanc. So because Tom really wanted to preserve freshness. Yeah. So yeah, that's been a cool cool trick. Um, we have another question. What are the differences in the winemaking between um, the Blue Line, the Reserve Cab, and the HG3? Okay, so differences in winemaking between the two estate wines relative to Cabernet. So Blue Line, Cabernet, Arabas, Estate Cabernet. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, Blue Line, HG3 and Blue Line, they're all made the same because basically HG3 has become the wines that don't make it into the Blue Line Estate Cab. You know, so it's they're made the same. They're all made really... It's hard to say and answer that question because every vintage dictates how I'm going to make things. Uh, there's no set parameters. There's no there's no always and nevers in the wine business. You tend to get in trouble when you work under those two parameters. Uh, but macerations tend to be a bit shorter for the estate. The estate has a lot more color come out of the grapes, a lot more tannin. So we tend to try to yeah, more free color, more mas massage those tannins a little bit better. Where Blue Line allows me to maybe go a little longer macerations. You're talking maybe 10 to 12 days on the estate. Uh, versus 10 to 20 days, 25 days on the, on the blue line. Uh, blue line is a blend. Blue line is all fiber. You know, not this year, but it has some deeper to where our glass is pure Cabernet. So I have to be cognizant of that. I'll have nothing to soften the tannins if it does become too tannic. So I have to be One of the things that Tony's doing now, though, is he's going back to something that we used to do quite a while back under, under Bob. And that is to take the hourglass estate side and break it into a number of different picks instead of picking it on a single day, which now gives Tony more... Um, more sort of passes at um, styles of wine to be able to blend. Well, you're building them. layers, and that's how we build layers within a state property. I was very lucky at Plump Jack to be within a state property. But the only way we could build layers is by picking at different times. So we do that. Whereas Blue Line is too as well, but I still have the luxury of going back to Merlot and have to soften it or Petit Brut if I want to make it a little bit denser, richer, or Malbec. Malbec's kind of the magic bullet if you do it right. I mean, it really is. It's got a ton of color with no tan, and it's like the magic wine. Works really well, but for some some vintages, it really doesn't spits the bit, so to probably, speak. Probably blending would be the biggest difference. Yeah, between the the two, uh, the four acre, of, you know, four acre vineyard, one clone, one site, you know, four acre. This is you know five different varietals at at my disposal. Six different clones of uh, Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Franc, Merlot. Three different clones of Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot. Blue Line has just an enormous amount of possibilities when you yeah. think of. The five different Bordeaux varietals, then multiple clonal selections underneath that, um, then the option of sequential picking different blocks, and you know, um, in previous years, the Blue Line Cabernet was two different blocks, two different lots. Yeah. And I think the first year Tony approached Cabernet, uh, the Blue Line Cabernet, I think we had what seventeen different 16, lines, yeah. sixteen different lines to choose from. So, and some people would say it's overkill, but it allowed us a really, really rigorous selection process of where the best parts were in the vineyard. And, you know, sometimes you learn it's all good. Sometimes you, you get smacked in the face pretty quickly. Like, whoa, we made a mistake. We shouldn't put that vineyard in, that block in. So. More questions? 
Yeah, um, were there any other kind of changes to um, what you do in the vineyards in 2012? Uh, changes in vineyard management uh, with Tony coming on board. I think I'm more in the vineyards now than Bob was. Bob was very busy. As I say, he wasn't in the vineyards, but I'm, I have a direct, you know, I talked to Kelly. and The vineyards were never, you know, for us taking to the next level, I think the vineyards were at that level when I came aboard. They just needed some winemaker input, you know. What we do now is we invite the wine, we invite Josh Clark, who's our vineyard manager, and Kelly Mars over the culture, and every year to taste the wines with us afterwards. I have I meet with them at least once a week during the harvest harvest season. Do we walk vineyards taste great? They taste tanks, and they say, "Here's what I'm looking for." They can kind of understand that. So um, that's probably more, again, it's it's these aren't big changes. These are blocking and tackling changes, um, but they're changes that do have a, a vast effect because once the vineyard cook team became more of a team with us. They started giving us much more information, to like, hey, well, we should be looking at this. Have you seen this corner? Yeah. Things that you might miss, and it's, it's, it's really just a big team effort. So I think, there's, I think there's better overall communication now, which makes for better decision making. Well, there was one thing. I started watering. Well, I, 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 yeah, 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 that's the one thing. That, that, that's a pretty, and that's that's a big deal. You know, is yeah. that the old school way of thinking? How you grew a vineyard was, you know, once you got to duration, you, like, you, you don't give it any more water until you harvest. You and give it any water yeah. at any time through. Yeah. It's kind of a, a dry farming mentality. And that's what was elevating your sugars. Right now, there's a huge change going on in Napa Valley with how we grow grapes and, and the generational change of understanding that some of these ideas that, made, that we thought made so much sense in here just don't anymore. That, you know, to get the best part of the growing season is October. It's because you could never really have heat run away from you or September you can't. So you want to keep the canopy green, you want to keep the fruit fresh. You give it water, you, you irrigate it, you keep it. So you can get to this October hang time where, you know, you're not looking at sugar, you're looking at phenolic ripeness. Yeah. And everybody thinks hang time was, you know, it was always sort of believed that, oh, we're hanging because we want to get 30 bricks. No, a lot of us were hanging the fruit out there because we wanted phenolic ripeness. Now, between Bordeaux is a longer growing season. People forget that. It's 20 days longer. And we're really paying attention now to the 100 days from fruit set to harvest, 60 days from veraison to harvest, whereas Bordeaux is 100, we say 120 days from fruit set to harvest because our growing season is shorter. Bordeaux is higher up on the, uh, on, you know, on the equator, uh, I can never say it. Good I'm not going to try. Thank you, line. So they, their, days are almost, <laughs> their days are almost two to three hours longer. Um, so they get more sunlight, and the sunlight's not as, as intense. So they can get phenolic ripeness without sugar. We, we're, you know, of course, the Mediterranean climate, we get a hotter sun, shorter days. So it's more intense. Whereas when Bordeaux's picking, we also have, we can get into this even longer, sorry, I don't want to go along. But I mean, we, we don't have the Atlantic Ocean, which is that time of year during harvest season is an incredibly aggressive ocean. Whereas the Pacific Ocean, every other time of year is very aggressive. But during harvest for us here in California, Everybody knows who's been in California, seen California, the best time of the year is September, October, November. Right. You know, that's the best weather. It's, you know, people, it's totally counterproductive to what everybody else thinks in the United States. So to get the grapes in October, you have to have a green canopy. Yeah. Because if you have yellow leaves, you're not doing anything but raising the fruit. Yeah, your chlorophyll's gone, so yeah. photosynthesis is not happening uh, in that environment. I, I, think there's, I think there's some mythology out there about dry farming as being the sort of end-all, be-all. And, and there, there are absolutely... Um, vineyards that benefit from dry farming um, in Napa, but it's not um, a uh, um, one suit fits all kind of, uh, kind of thing. And um, I know that for our sites that are heavily rock laden sites, um, um, dry farming is maybe suicide in some years. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely not the thing to be doing. Um, and so what we've, what we've learned about water application, and we've learned a lot in the last five or six years, there's some really cutting edge stuff going on that's, that's um, some companies are, are um, tracking sap flow monitoring and, and giving us a lot of information relative to what the plant is experiencing and what it's going through. And what we're learning right now is that um, water, the timing of watering is more important than if you water or if you don't water. It's when you water. And so... We tend to keep things as dry as we possibly can up until veraison. The plant is taking an enormous amount of hormonal cues from what's going on in soil temperature and, and soil available moisture and, and nutrients and so forth. So if we can get that plant um, to be in a, in a slightly more stressed environment where it's taking its hormonal cues through the spring and the early summer before veraison, um, berry sizing happens during that period. So that's a really important hormonal cue that we're sending to the plant. We want those very small to the extent that we can get them. And then once we get through beration, 
Then all of a sudden the game changes a little bit. Your berry sizing is pretty much set by that point. Your sugar development is not complete, but it's very it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, now what Tony's talking about is keeping the plants alive without pushing them into their vegetative cycle, but keeping them alive to keep the canopies green so you have plenty of chlorophyll, so you have photosynthesis that's going on, and you can develop phenolic ripeness without your sugar spiking. So if you have desiccation of the plants, if you have um, water stress late in the season and the plant can't get available water from the soil, it's going to get it from wherever it can. And that might be the grape. So if, if your grapes all of a sudden start dehydrating and you start losing your, your water, the sugar molecules don't leave. So now all of a sudden sugar is a much higher percentage of your total mass, your berry mass. And so you really don't want to encourage the plant to go grab water out of the, out of the, the grapes themselves. So what we're trying to do in all of this is to create a really balanced grape chemistry at the, at the end. We want phenol, this phenolic ripeness, which is a function of having the right amount of phenols, right amount of tannins, right amount of color, right amount of sugar, right amount of acid, right pH, all of that stuff. And the problem is that that ripening isn't, it doesn't all happen on the same day. It happens in sequence, and there are yeah. a bunch of things that happen. I can sit down and show you guys out there, in case I want to cut the winery. Sequential dates I've done it, and it's the difference, the difference of grape chemistry. And it's all based on the growing season. And, you know, in the, end, in the end, the grape gets to where it wants to get to. It's how we get it out of the grapes. You know, well, but in the end, we want it. We want it to get to a certain yeah, point. we do. And if we get it, so the holy grail, I think, of Napa is trying to get phenolic ripeness without your sugar spiking out of control and you, the loss of acidity. And I think 13 is, is I think 10 was one of those ventures that showed us that because it was, it was, we made great wines. We're getting smarter ventures. and smarter yeah. about how to get there. You know, you, you go through this spectrum of ripeness trying to figure out what it all means and you get way out to this uber ripe area and you go, okay, well, maybe that's not the answer, but you know, so how do, but, but there's some cool things out there too. There's this richness and this density that is, that's really attractive. So how do I get that without losing, without having these excessive alcohols and no acid in my wine? Okay, well, now I need to rethink the game. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're kind of rethinking the game as we go along. And farming has a lot to do with that. And Tony's ability to look into that complex web that is all of these chemical relationships make sense of that so that we can then go back and reinform our farming based on what we're trying to accomplish in the end game which is which is you know grape chemistry that is balanced those two things are are really important to leading to really highly precise wines and and we you know we still have a ways to go to figure this this whole puzzle out but i, I mean tony's brought an enormous amount of um, understanding from a great chemistry and a, 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 a wine chemistry standpoint to marry those two things together. So our farming gets a little bit better, our winemaking gets a little bit better. And it's not like one thing that we change that is the holy grail thing. It's a sequence of a whole lot of little things, basically. There you go. Quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're over time, but we needed to be for some of the questions. Okay. I hope we didn't bore yeah. the crap out of everybody. Maybe one more thing, uh, Jeff, to talk a little bit since HG3, you know, just conceptually is a mm -hmm. new introduction, HG3, just to... HG3? Yeah. Did we not... You did talk about that, I just mean, like, sort of, is there anything else people can anticipate or anything you want to share about? No, I, you know, I mean, HG3 is a, is a pretty simple thing. It's going to so, change. I mean, to tell you that, the blend's going to change right here. No, yeah. seriously, it's just, it will. we don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work in the blend, so yeah. I think 13 is more cabinet-based. I'm more Malbec, Malbec based. So. Listen, I'm, I'm really proud of HG3. I think it's a great addition to the portfolio. But let's make no mistake, our focus is about our estate wines. And this is a function of our focus on the estate wines being laser, laser sharp. And, um, and with the changes that Tony has implemented in terms of barrel aging and how we go about that and having these really cool little odds and ends that are left over that don't really have a home yet. HG3 becomes a home for, for those wines, and um, and so I'm really happy that we have a home. It's kind of sad to think about bulking out some of these wines that are really tasty and really good, but maybe didn't you know meet the final final for whatever reason. Who 
Who makes that final decision? Last question. Who makes the final decision on HD3? Mm -hmm. On blending, on what makes you know the estate, uh, the blue line estate, and what makes. I mean, I can answer. It. So Jeff, in the end, I work for Jeff, and and we've had you know the luck is that Jeff. The weird thing is that he's an aromatic guy. I'm a textual guy, but I'm enough aromatic guy. He's enough textual guy. But we almost always agree on it. Yeah, and they were talking. You know, there might be a two percent hit here or there. Hey, do I roll my eyes? Of course I do. But in the end, I have to remember who owns the winery. Um, you know, it, again, you know, I always remember going to tastings the other day. You know, there's two percent franc in a blend. So I love the franc in that blend. I'm like, I forgot to even in there. You know, and it's so the, rea the reality of it is, you know, it's Jeff's winery, and Jeff, you know, I have. I will if I believe something. Jeff knows I won't back down to him. But most often than not, we're always sure. in agreement where we're going. And it's it's you have to be. I'll have to be on the same team. And I understand there are decisions that are above my pay grade. If you understand what I mean by that, I mean that he needs to look at a winery long term viability as well as. But I'll never let him make a short term decision that's going to hurt our long term viability. And I've worked too many great places to let that happen even here. And I'll, I'll, I'll let him know my opinion. But, I mean, it's his winery. It's Jeff's winery. So. But the reality is you don't hire somebody like Tony, uh, his skill set and caliber, um, to, you know, relegate him to not having a really, really strong, if not final, decision on, on a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I, trust him, I trust Tony implicitly. If you were to go have lunch with us or dinner with us, you'd, be, you'd probably get a chuckle out of it because uh, the two of us would probably order the same thing. And, yeah, usually, um, usually white burgundy. Yeah, um, either, either wine and or food. I mean, we'll, we'll often order the same things. And that tells you a lot about how our palates are calibrated. And, um, and one of the reasons that we work really well together is that we have a pretty tight, um, uh, pretty tightly calibrated palate. Um, as Tony said, he's going to err a little bit more on the, on the side of palate impression where I'm going to err a little bit more on the side of aromatics. And these are subtleties, really. I mean, at the end of the day, and but we argue over this stuff, yeah. and it's good. I was because... weaned on Bordeaux, so Bordeaux is sometimes much more textural-driven wine than it is aromatics, where, you know, that's sort of, I, I fall into that category. It's just my, my blind spot, you know. So. And so what the cool thing is, is that we allow each other to, to push each other, I think, in really constructive ways. And when we do that, we often find that sort of holy grail right in the middle. Sometimes it takes us a little while to get there, but we know where we know where each one of us wants to go, you know. And then when we get to an impasse, quite a few, quite often it'll be sort of a varietal decision. It's it's you know if it's you know if it's the Cap Franc, which is sort of my passion and my love. A lot of times Tony will just defer and say, okay, well if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Um, you know, or if it's if it's Blue Line Cab, Tony's going to say, no, God damn it. You need to you need to back down and trust me on this, and I almost always do. Yeah, so no, I mean, it's funny. Jeff and I have this ongoing argument. I think we'll have it for the rest of the time. Yeah, I've been with it. You know, different's not better. Different is different. So um, Jeff loves drinking yeah. because he because he comes back to me and goes, "No, I don't know." Sometimes, so, sometimes. So we have this wonderful the back and forth, you know. And so, but it's really healthy. It's yeah, a really it's healthy not, sort of. You know, just we always laugh at it. So, but it's good. I mean, in the end, you have to have a team that understands where they're going. I mean, you're working for enough wineries now to get to where you're going everybody has to be on the same bus jeff drives the yeah. bus I, i'm the mechanic i fix the engine i was joking earlier i said he you know he's the D I, i'm the dj he's the rapper so um <laughs> sort of how it works so i'm a terrible rapper yeah, so <laughs> so, <laughs> so okay, i guess we have to wrap good? up yeah. okay, we're wrapping it up everybody have a great night Thanks. thank you all for spending some time with us we really appreciate it can't wait to do this again with you guys we just got you.